talked about be strong in the Lord. This morning, I'm going to talk about standing in an evil day in which we stand. Let's begin by reading verse number 13 together. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand in an evil day, having done all to stand. Uh, we have to do all the whole armor of God. We need the whole armor of God in order to be able to stand and uh, withstand as well. The word withstand, for example, that word for stand is a very important word. It's what history means. It means to make a firm and fixed position, be established, to establish and cause it to stand. Many people today are moving all over the place uh, in the, the word is used for foundation of the building. <clears throat> when you build a, ba a building, the foundation doesn't move. It stays right there. That's what God wants us to do, stand firm. Withstand, in Second Chronicles 20, verse 6, and none is able to withstand thee. There are many verses that have to do with standing. We're in a day where churches and pastors and preachers and other people and Christians are moving and gradually drifting away from the Bible, the stand of the Scripture. Our church stands, and we've stood here for some 18 years, going on 19. Pretty soon, we're going to continue to stand for the Scripture. Many verses on the word to stand, but in Romans 5 and verse 2, uh, we have access by faith unto this grace, wherein we stand, no movement on the grace of God. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13, watch, stand fast. In the faith, the doctrines of the Bible, stand fast. Not move, not sway, but stand fast. And then in Galatians 5, verse 1, stand fast in the liberty where God has made us free. Stand fast. That means strongly stand, permanently stand. In Ephesians 6 and verse 11, put on the whole armor of God, right here, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's the only way can make us, who will save Christians, stand by the armament and the armor of God. And then in Philippians 4, verse 1, Paul says to the Christians of Philippi, Stand fast in the Lord. Stand fast, strong in the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 8, Now we live if ye stand fast. Paul ministered to the Thessalonian Christians, and we're going to live if you stand fast. If you don't stand fast, it hurts Paul's ministry and his feelings and his heart. In 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 15, uh, Brethren, Stand fast. Again, stand fast. Firm. Don't move. And then in Revelation 6, 17, <clears throat> great day of the wrath, Lord's wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand? And when the death of God comes in the tribulation period, they won't be able to stand. Then as far as uh, against these days of evil, that first verse, 13 verse says, uh, to stand in the evil day. We have more evil going on today than we had in the 89 years that I've been living, evil is strong against us. And how to deal with it? Uh, we're to hate evil. Uh, the modernist liberals apostates say, don't hate anything. Just love, love, love. No. Evil comes, despise it. Here's some verses on it. Proverbs 3, 7. Depart from evil. Just leave it. Proverbs 4, 14. Do not go in the way of evil men. They walk one way, you walk the other way. In Proverbs 4, verse 27. Remove thy foot from evil. Just take your foot away from it. And Proverbs 8, and verse 12. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Hate evil. Despise it. And the evil way in the forward mouth do I hate. The Lord hates evil. He hates the forward mouth. And we should hate it as well. In Proverbs 14, 16. A wise man feareth and departeth from evil. The fool doesn't, but the wise men do. And Matthew 6.13, Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. Deliver from evil ways. All kinds of evil going on. On the television, on magazines, internet, all of these things. Many, many evil things. In John 3.19, this is a condemnation that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. The evil deeds of people, they love the darkness. And John 17.15, Lord, say prayer before the Father. I pray thou shouldst not take them out of the world, but thou shouldst keep them from evil. Keep them from evil. Guard them. In Romans 12 and verse 9, 
Abhor, that means hate, despise that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. In Romans 12, 21, be not overcome with evil, overcome evil with good. And then in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 15, verse 33, be not deceived. Evil communication, evil associations corrupt good manners. They corrupt them. They make them so that they're not worthy. So don't go with these false people and rub shoulders with them and be in their company. Because if you do, the evil can they destroy and make you evil as well. And uh, these are some of the things that corrupt good manners. Then in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 7, I pray God, do no evil. Don't even walk with evil. Don't do any evil as well. In Galatians 1 verse 4, the Lord Jesus gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from the present evil world. It's an evil world. It's delivered us from it. Many things about it that's evil. In Ephesians 5 and verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. If they're evil in Paul's day, how much more evil they are today in our day. It's certainly true. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5.22, very clear command, abstain from all appearance of evil. Not just the evil, but what if it appears wrong? Abstain from it. Stay away from it. Any appearances that you do or say or where you go, that's evil. And then in 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 3, in verse 3, the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and keep you from evil. Only the Lord can keep us strong from evil. Count on Him for that. In 2 Corinthians 3, verse 13, evil men, seducers, shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Continue in the things that thou hast learned and continue knowing them. So stay away from the evil, follow the scriptures. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 18, the scriptures define what's good and what's evil. Not the television, not the internet, not our, our government, but the scriptures. In 2 Timothy 4, in verse 16, the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, said Paul, even though he's in prison and jail in Rome, and will preserve me under the heavenly kingdom. That was his last letter, 2 Timothy, he'll preserve him from evil. In 3 John, verse 11, Beloved, follow, that which is, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. We've got to do these things, stand fast, stand firm in the evil days. Let's read verse number 14 together. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth, and having the not breastplate of righteousness. Stand firm. Standing, don't move, don't wilt, don't uh, drift, but again, stand firm. There are seven different implements in God's armor. The first two are mentioned in this verse. Your loins girt about with truth. Truth. Not the, not the, wickedness, the world's truth or the devil's truth, but the words of God, which are the truth. There's a number of verses on what truth is. In John 8, 32, we know this one, say it together. And ye shall know the truth, and truth shall make you free. The truth of the word of God, that's what real truth is, not what people think it to be. And then in John 8, 44, we know this one perhaps. Uh, ye are your father the devil. And the lions shall bless your father, you shall do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and go not in the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh of the lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, a father of it. Speaking to the Pharisees, and they're of the devil, they're the sons of the devil, they're unsaved people, and those that are unsaved around us. The father is the devil, he doesn't abode in, abide in the truth. And then in John 14, 6, we know that one. Let's say that one. You have Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father, but by me. These are things of truth. He is the truth. We're to abide. And this shield, the, the loins girt about with truth. Then in John 15, 26, when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, the Spirit of truth. That's his title, the Spirit of Truth. The Holy Spirit gave the words of Scripture. Christ told the Holy Spirit what to write down. The Old New Testament, the writers wrote them down. The Spirit of Truth, the words of God speak of truth. And then in John 16, 12, I have many things to say unto you, the Lord Jesus said. He cannot bear them now. But notice, but how be it when he, the Spirit of Truth, is come. That's the Holy Spirit. He will guide you into all truth. Not speak of or from himself as the source, 
but whatsoever ye shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come. And they will glorify me, for he will receive of mine, shall show it unto you. Uh, he will take of mine and show it unto you. That the Lord Jesus Christ is the author of every, every word in the Greek language, in the New Testament Greek uh, position. He's also the, God, the author of every Old Testament, by extension, Old Testament words as well. And he gave those words, Hebrew and Aramaic words in the Old Testament, Greek words in the New, to the writers and wrote them down. And they're true words. The Lord Jesus is the source of them and the author. And then in John 17, 17, we know that one. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The word of God is truth. And we have that as a weapon, loin screwed about with truth. And then in Romans 1, 25, the people in the early ages changed the truth of God into a lie. They didn't receive the truth of God. The pagan early people. And today many of them are doing the same thing. In 1 Corinthians 13, 6. Talking about love or charity, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. We should rejoice in the truth. Our loins should be good or about with it. And then in Galatians 4, 16. Paul says, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Many times when we get enemies, we're telling the truth. They don't want to hear it. And uh, 2 Timothy 2.16, 2.15, we know that one, say that one. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We've got to divide properly the scriptures, the word of God. That's why we believe in our church in the dispensational view of the scriptures. We divide it, dispensation. They're all not the same thing. Now, God did not tell us to build an ark. Uh, he gave that to Noah. It's a different situation. All the, he didn't give us the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament and the Law of Moses. He gave us the New Testament. So we've got to rightly divide the word of truth. And many churches get all mixed up about it. And all sorts of errors come in because they don't rightly divide the word of God and the word of truth. And then in 2 Timothy 3.17, 3.7 rather, this is a, what's happened to many people today. They go to college and, and seminary and graduate school, ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Those secular courses don't lead you to the truth of the Word of God. And then in 2 Timothy 4, in verse 2, we say this all the time in our services. Let's say it together if we know it. Preach the Word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, all long suffering and doctrine. For the time shall come that they will not endure a sound doctrine, but with their own lusts they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, shall be turned into fables. That's what they're doing all the time. These new versions cause them to turn into fables uh, because they're not true to the Word of God. Some 356 doctrinal portions are false. And they're turning away their ears from the truth, the fables, just uh, funny stories. Then in Titus 1, verse 13, uh, when they're walking against the truth, Pastor Titus was told by Paul, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the truth, not giving heed to true as fables, <coughs> commands of men, but turning from, that turn from the truth. These fables turn us from the truth. <coughs> so we should put on one of the first armaments out of the seven, our loins, heard about with truth. The second armor of God is the breastplate. That covers the chest, that covers the heart, the very significant part, the breastplate of righteousness. A number of verses uh, that have to do with that, not our righteousness, but certainly the righteousness of God. In Romans 4, rather 6 and verse 12, but not sin reign in your mortal body, but neither yield yourself the members instruments of unrighteousness, but unto God and your members unto righteousness unto God. A righteousness standing for the things of the Lord are like a breastplate that will keep our whole chest and heart sound and healthy. In Romans 6 and verse 19, you have not yielded your members servants to uncleanness, to iniquity, even so now yield your members servants of righteousness to holiness. Walking in the righteousness of God and the right and the standards of the Lord to be righteous, that's like a breastplate. And then uh, 1 Corinthians 15.34, awake to righteousness. So now we've got to awake to it and keep, if we're generally Christians, 
our righteous standing before God is there, you've got to have a righteous standing before the world as well. That's like a breastplate. And Ephesians 4, verse 24, Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Put on that new nature, not the old nature, the flesh, which is sinful. In Ephesians 5, and verse 9, Fruit of the Spirit is all goodness and righteousness. God's Holy Spirit gives fruit and righteousness in our actions. And that's a, like the loins, uh, like the breastplate, rather. In Philippians 1, and verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. And we've got to be filled with that in order to withstand the blows of the devil. In 2 Timothy 2, and verse 22, flee also youthful nuts, lusts, but follow righteousness. Righteousness must be followed. Where do you find it? In the Scripture. You don't find it in the funny papers or in newspapers or magazines or television on the internet, but in the Word of God. <clears throat> and then in uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, we know this one, let's say it together. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And that's, that's where we go, that's where we go for instruction in righteousness from the Scriptures, the Word of God. That's where we find righteousness. In Hebrews 1 and verse 9, Lord Jesus Christ, Loved righteousness, hated, hated iniquity. We should follow the Lord and do righteousness from the Scriptures. Let's read verse number 15 together. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This is another, the third of the seven different parts of the armor of God that we should take upon ourselves. The feet, where we walk. And it's the gospel of peace. The feet where we walk. We've got to know how to walk. We have to know what the gospel is. A lot of people don't know what the gospel is. They haven't stretched the scripture. They don't realize there are two or three different things about the good news. It starts with the bad news. If you're preaching to somebody that doesn't believe they're sinners, and that's bad news, they're not receptive to the good news of the gospel. They first must realize all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then secondly, they've got to realize there's someone that came into this world, Lord Jesus Christ, and died for their sins on the cross of Calvary. He died for the sins of the whole world. Now simply that second point in the gospel doesn't make them saved, just because Christ died for their sins. The third point of the good news in the gospel, they must receive that Savior, trust Him, believe on Him, and accept Him as their Savior, and that will give them eternal life and everlasting. That's the gospel. Our feet should be shod with that gospel. Every step we take, we've got to, when the door opens, we've got to be ready to, put, to give people that good news. Bad news first, good news second. And have them trust the Lord Jesus. In Romans 1.16, we know that one. Let's say it together. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. That's the gospel, the good news, uh, Jew and Greek as well. And then in Romans 5, verse 1, we know that one. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified by faith is part of the gospel. Let's read verse number 16 together. Above all, taking the shield of faith, or with you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. This is the fourth armament that God has given to us. The shield of faith. Now look at that word, distress, which is faith. And the article is there, the faith. That means the doctrines of the scriptures, the doctrines of the Bible. It just fell on the front. It's all right. Just got kicked out. No problem. It's the doctrinal scriptures, the doctrines of the Bible, the theology. There's a shield that guards our whole area of our bodies, you know, the front part especially. And there's several verses on that shield of faith. In Genesis 15:1, uh, God told Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield. God is the shield, the faith, shield of faith, the doctrine of the scripture, and God himself is a shield. In 2 Samuel 22, verse 3, God is my rock, and him I will trust, he is my shield. Uh, the Lord is a shield against all the many darks of the wicked one that come at us. We've got to really believe that, believe that and trust that. In 2 Samuel 22, 36, God has also given me the shield of thy salvation. In this case, salvation is also a shield. Shield from danger, shield from the hell's fire, uh, the, with the fiery furnace. And then in Psalm 
3, verse 3. Again, thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. Even in the Old Testament, the psalmist and other believers of the Old Testament could see the Lord was shielding them from harm. He doesn't always shield us, but he does many times be our shield. Sometimes he lets us go into dangers and lets us fall into that danger. So many times he's our shield if we'll trust him. And Psalm 28, 7. Uh, the psalmist says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. The shield. And we're to take unto us the shield of the faith, the shield of the scriptures, the shields of the doctrines. And how are you going to take that shield if you don't know anything about <coughs> the doctrines? You don't know what the faith is. You can't have it a shield. But all the doctrines of the book of the Bible, you've got to be believe it, use them. In Psalm 33, verse 20. Again, in the Old Testament, the Lord, He is our help and our shield. God shields His people, even the Old Testament Israelites. And then Psalm 84, verse 11. The Lord God is a sun and shield. A sun and shield, both. In Psalm 115, verse 9, He is our help and our shield. Even the Old Testament realized that God was a shield, and we've got to take the shield of faith, the scriptural understanding of the Word of God. In Psam 144, verse 2, and my goodness, my fortress, talking about the Lord, and my shield, in he in whom, whom I trust. And then in Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. So take the shield of faith, as I said before, it's the faith, which is the doctrines of the scriptures, the things that God wants us to know about and care about and to use. Let's read verse number 17 together. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The helmet of salvation that guards our heads, that guards our brains. Very serious. And salvation is the helmet that God has given to us. If we're genuinely saved, trusting Christ as our Savior, that's like a helmet protecting our head and the brains of what we think and what we do. Very important indeed. And Isaiah 59, 17, for example, he put on righteousness as a breastplate. He put on righteousness as a breastplate. Protect us. Not only protect us, but also the helmet of salvation. And a helmet of salvation upon his head. So they have both these things that God has protected in the Old Testament. The helmet of salvation. Then in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 8, Let us swear of the day, be sober putting on the breastplate of faith and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. So we've got the helmet to guard our heads. Uh, all those people, I guess they have new laws now. When I was younger, they didn't have these laws. But now, riding a bike, put a hat on. Riding a motor scooter, a motorbike, a motorcycle, put on a helmet. Uh, we've got to have the helmet of salvation, the salvation of the Lord. <coughs> then the sixth item of this armor of the Lord is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit. And that Word of God is given to us. The Lord Jesus wrote, gave the Holy Spirit the words. The Holy Spirit gave to the writers the words. It's the sword of the Spirit. The Word. That word for word is rema. It means the spoken word. We've got to have memorized scripture so we can speak the word. Sometimes it's too hard to open up our Bibles and look the verse to give to it. Many times we must memorize the scripture. The rhema of God is the word, the sword, the spirit. So we can quote it and use it and guard it and keep it for the glory of the Lord. Let's read verse number 18 together. Praying always with all prayer and supplication of the spirit and watching there too with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Paul says, be interceding for the saints. Supplication and prayer for the other believers. Supplication for the saints and praying always. And there are a number of verses on praying, but Colossians 1 9. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you. The church in Colossae, Paul was in jail. He still said, I'm going to pray for you. We're out of jail day by day, praying for you. Do not cease. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17, we command pray without ceasing. Uh, we could think our prayers. We don't have to help speak it, but even as we walk down the way, thank the Lord, help us as I walk. Help me the step after step. Pray without ceasing. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 26, Paul said to the Thessalonian Christians, Brethren, pray for us. I need prayer, said Paul. 
and all of us need prayer. Pray for one another. Pray for us. In 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 11, Wherefore also, we pray also for you. So God told Paul he should pray for them too, and Paul did intercede for them uh, at the Thessalonican church, that our God would count you worthy of this calling. And then in 1 Timothy 2, in verse 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. That men pray everywhere. The believers, especially those that love the Lord, pray everywhere. Lifting up holy hands without wrath. And then in James 5 and verse 16, confess your faults unto another and pray one for another. That ye may be healed. Pray, intercede one for another. Intercessory prayer for believers is very important. It says watching there too. Uh, watching, praying, and that word is in the present that continuously praying. Uh, then watching, continuously watching there too. That word watching, our group now, is a continuous action means to keep awake, attentive, be ready, and watch to pray. Sometimes we fall asleep when we're praying, sometimes we can't pray because we're sleeping. Let's read verse number 19 together. And for me, an utterance that be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Pray for me too, please, he says. Pray for me. Uh, you people in, in Ephesus, that utterance, even in prison, I can still preach and still speak. I was in prison for preaching the gospel. They helped me in the prison to preach also. Utterance be given. Open my mouth boldly, even in jail. Boldly. He didn't quit preaching, nor did the early church when the government said, Stop preaching in the name of the Lord Jesus. Stop teaching in his name. And they he was preached boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. As far as bold and boldly, many verses in John seven twenty six, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know that this is the very Christ? The Lord Jesus spoke bold, strong, conviction. And Acts 9, 27, uh, how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus, taking by Paul. He preached boldly after he was saved in chapter 9. He preached, preached boldly. And Acts 9, 29, again, speaking of Paul after his conversion, he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. Boldness is not a quantity that's part of many Christian believers today. I would say some of them are like chickens. Quack, 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 or ducks, whatever. They just don't speak boldly. They don't live boldly. They don't believe boldly. They don't have convictions. When we speak to the things of the Lord, there must be convictions and boldness. In Acts 14 and verse 3, long time therefore both they speaking boldly in the Lord. Book of Acts, bold speaking in the Lord. And in Acts 19 and verse 8, he went into the synagogue, Paul did, and spake boldly for the place of three available three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. He wasn't afraid. He boldly spoke in those areas. And then uh, in Ephesians 6 and verse 20, for which I am ambassador in bonds. That's where we're going to learn that a little bit later. For which I am an ambassador in bonds that I, therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Even in prison, in writing of Ephesians, he would speak boldly. That's what he wants to do. That's what verse we're going to read next. So let's go to verse number 20 and read that. For which also I am an ambassador of bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. The gospel was the for which I am an ambassador in bonds. He's an ambassador and a continuous ambassador. Continuous, yes, a present tense continuous action. An ambassador is the highest ranking diplomat representative appointed by the one country or government to represent it in another government. That's what an ambassador is by definition. And official agent with a special mission. Paul is an ambassador with a special mission to lead the prisoners that he speaks to right there in prison to the Lord. Ambassador in bonds, he was in prison, he realized, because he was a minister and preacher of the Word of God and the Lord Jesus. In Proverbs 13, 17, a wicked messenger falleth into mischief, but a faithful ambassador 
his health, even in private, faithful ambassador, representative of the Lord, representative of the Savior. In Obadiah, verse 1, the vision of Obadiah concerning Eden. We have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, let us go, and rise up in, in battle. So an ambassador even in the Old Testament. So Paul was a representative on a mission even in prison for the Lord Jesus Christ. Ambassador for the Lord. And notice he's in bonds. Ambassador in bonds, in chains, in Roman prison. The first Roman imprisonment. And they had a second one too. And at the second one, uh, they did behead him according to scripture or tradition. And he died. <coughs> the first Roman imprisonment. He was in bonds. Acts 20, verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and various other things. And saying that the bonds and afflictions abide me. The bonds and afflictions abide me. He preached strong, said all these things publicly, and he realized that there were bonds coming up. And the bonds did take a hold of him and captured him. In Acts 23, verse 29, um, he says, To have nothing laid up to his charge, worthy of death or of bonds. He wished, in Acts 23, that he would not have things worthy of death or bonds, but Paul was in bonds. He was bound in chains in Rome imprisonment. In Acts 26, in verse 31, uh, again, he's giving his testimony here. And it was they gone and they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. They, wouldn't, they didn't say he deserved death or bonds, but he appealed to Caesar, therefore they went to Rome, as you know. But they realized he did nothing worthy of death or bonds. In Philippians 1.13, my bonds in Christ are manifest. He's writing from prison again. The Church of Philippians, or the book of Philippians is from prison again. First Roman imprisonment. He says, the bonds in Christ. He was in prison because of the Lord Jesus Christ, because of his testimony, and they're manifest. He's preaching Christ even in prison. In Colossians 4, verse 3, the mystery of Christ, he talks about Colossians, for which I'm also in bonds. Colossians. He was a prisoner there when he wrote Colossians. He says, because of Christ, I'm in bonds. And you and I may be in bonds one day in the FEMA camps when they come after us, if we continue to preach Christ. We're not on the side of those atheists that are running our government. Many of them run our government. We may face bonds as well, or imprisonment. Maybe we'll be on the other end of a guillotine in the FEMA camps <coughs> that are prepared for those that disagree with the liberal leftist socialist communist government that is going to be pretty soon. So in 2 Timothy, uh, also verse chapter 2, verse 9, wherein I suffered trouble as an evildoer. He wasn't an evildoer, but suffer as an evildoer, as you and I may suffer as an evildoer, even under bonds, imprisonment. And Philemon, verse 10, again he was writing from prison, and this word Philemon, he was in prison there when he wrote that. I, I beseech thee for my son Onesipus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. When he was in prison, he led Onesipus to the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. He kept preaching the gospel. He had his feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of Christ. Let's read verse number 21 together. But that ye also may know my affairs, how I do, teach us, beloved brother, faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things. So Tychicus, this is his last letter in Ephesians, his last letter, last chapter. He says, I want you to Ephesus, Church of Ephesus, to know what I'm doing. And so I sent Tychicus. He's a beloved, a loved brother, saved person, and faithful minister. Not just a minister just in halfway, but a faithful. You know what? He'll make known to you the things that I'm doing. The number of verses on Tychicus, not too many, but a few in Acts 20 and verse 4. There accompanied him Paul unto Asia, and Tychicus, and Trophimus. He was accompanying Paul to Asia. In Ephesians 6, 24, uh, grace be to you, and he sent that letter in, by Tychicus. He was the amanuensis, he was a, a secretary, a stenographer. And then Colossians 4 and verse 9, now all my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, that Colossae, and at Ephesus, Tychicus was going to tell them exactly what was happening when Paul was in prison. As a beloved brother and a faithful minister. 
in Colossians 4, verse 18. Again, this prison epistle, salutation by the hand of Paul, and it says, written from Rome by Tychicus, another amanuensis, several places. He, he wrote, copied Paul's letters. Uh, and then 2 Timothy 4, verse 12. And I, Tychicus, have I sent to Ephesus. Paul said, I sent him so he'll know, to tell you all that have this happened to me in prison. In Titus 3, in verse 12. I'll send Artemis uh, or Tychicus. Be diligent to come. So the various verses on Tychicus, but he was sent to the church at Ephesus to tell them all that was happening to Paul in prison. And he was a faithful minister. That's what every minister of Christ should be faithful. In Colossians 1 and verse 7, uh, Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister. Epaphras was a faithful minister as Tychicus. And then Colossians 4, 7, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, my beloved brother, faithful minister, and so he was faithful in Paul declared. Let's read verse number 22 together. Whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might be your prayers, and that he might comfort you in your hearts. He comfort your hearts. So know our affairs, but also be a comfort to you. Barry Leticicus was skilled in comfort. For instance, in John 11, 19, many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning the brother Lazarus who had died. Comfort is given. Sometimes good comfort, sometimes bad comfort. In Romans 15, 4, we know that one, we'll say it together. Whatsoever things are written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Comfort of the Scriptures. The Scriptures give comfort to us. If we read them and study them and learn them faithfully, 2 Corinthians Nobody can give you comfort if you're not even anywhere. If you're 100, 100 yards away from the comforter, you can't have the comfort. So stick to the scriptures and read them and study. In 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3, Blessed be God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. He is the God of all comfort. He's the one that can comfort us. Troubles, difficulties, sicknesses, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, all our troubles. And we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted about. Comfort, comfort, comfort. God gives us comfort. Comfort others. Others have problems. Comfort them. In 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 6, uh, Sufficient <coughs> is a man, which is afflicted by many, and so contrast you ought to, rather to forgive him and comfort him, that perhaps he should be swallowed up in over much sorrow. Comfort even the ones that are doing wrong. The church at Corinth, this man was an incestuous man, probably referred to here. Uh, comfort him, regardless. In, second, in Philippians 2, verse 19, I trust the Lord Jesus sent Timothy shortly, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. Paul wanted to know what was happening also to the church of Philippi. And when he learns that, he can be comforted because he knows what's happening to them, and he wanted to be of comfort because of it. In 1 Thessalonians 3, in verse 2, I sent Timothy and uh, our fellow laborer, the gospel, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. So here was another comforter, Timothy. Not only Tychicus, but Timothy. Uh, I sent to the churches to comfort. They were in a lot of trouble. Perhaps they were in poverty. Perhaps they didn't have any food. They were hungry. Who knows? What they, were. they were sick. And Timothy's going to send to, be, to comfort them. And then in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, I would give you, not be ignorant, brethren, concerning them that are asleep, those that are, uh, who have died, Christians that have died. You soar not, even as others. Because they're going to, the Lord's going to bring with them these people, and you'll not pre prevent those that are asleep, but the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Talking about the rapture, taking every saved, born again Christian out of this this world before that great tribulation comes the seven years gone <coughs> and those that have died before that happens don't be worried about them they're going to be with us they're going to be the dead in Christ will rise first those Christians that are saved first and go up to heaven then we which are alive still at the rapture will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord there wherefore comfort one another with these words he's telling the Christians in his day not to be sorrowing because the loved one has died and gone. You will see them comfort one another with these words. 
Then in verse 25, let's read that one. Peace be to the brethren, and love unto faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace. Uh, Isaiah 26, verse 3, perhaps we know that one. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. God's peace. And then Isaiah 28, in verse 17. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness. I was cast to all my sins. Deliver me from the pit of corruption. Cast my sins behind thy back. He, had, he lacked peace. And then in Isaiah 52, in verse 7. A beautiful upon the mountains of the feet of them that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, bringeth good tidings of good. So this is important in the Old Testament. Even. Isaiah 57, verse 20. The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose mires and waters cast up mire and dirt. Then we know this. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. No peace. It's like the troubled sea. Continuously all cascading back and forth, mire and dirt. Then in John 14, 27, the Lord Jesus, you know this, let's say it together. Peace I leave with thee. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world give I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Not your heart be troubled. My peace. Those who are genuine Christians can give us peace no matter what our turmoil is, what our sickness, what our problems, whatever it is. He can give us peace. True peace. In John 16, 33. Lord Jesus, of these things I spoke unto you, that in me ye might have peace. The apostles had no peace. They were persecuted. Every one of them except the Apostle John was killed and crucified. All different things happened to them. They were taken apart. But I will give you peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. In good cheer I have overcome the world. In Romans 5, 1, we know that one. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5.1 is a tremendous verse. Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, love, joy peace. peace. Part of the fruit, the being controlled with the Spirit of God, can give a genuine Christian true peace. Genuine Christian, true peace. Even in the midst of war, he gives it peace. In Philippians 4.6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes from all understanding, shall keep the hearts and minds of Christ Jesus. And the peace of God shall keep us. And in Colossians 1, verse 20, the Lord Jesus, having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things to himself. The Lord Jesus made peace by the blood of his cross. We've had many definitions of peace. Some have tried to memorize this one, but in Christianity, it's the tranquil state of a soul assured of his salvation through Christ and so fearing nothing from God and content with his earthly lot of whatsoever it is. That's true peace. We're trying to remember, it's hard to remember, it's kind of a long one there, but peace of God. Let's read verse number 24 together. Grace be unto you and love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Uh, this is written by Tetris. You remember, that's his song of his agitation. But grace giving us something we do not deserve. He says his final uh, final part of his letter, grace, then two things. Love the Lord Jesus Christ, but in sincerity. There are lots of fools that are not sincere. Christians that can put on a good face, a good front, and fake their love for Christ. But he's saying grace to those who love for Christ in sincerity. In Romans 3.24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Number of verse on grace. In 1 Corinthians 15.10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. And so Paul had God's grace. Then in 1 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, we know that one, let's say that one. For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, that for your sins He became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. He devoted himself, came from heaven's glory. He was rich, became poor, that you might, by trusting him, might be rich in Christ. Ephesians 2, verse 8. We know that one. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then Hebrews 2, verse 9. 
we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. That's God's grace. That the Lord Jesus tasted death on the cross for the sins of the world, every man. Horrible death indeed. A perfect, holy God, God the Son, taking wickedness and evil into himself, which he knew nothing of, terrible, as well as the pain, severe pain of the crucifixion. In Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Very important, time of need. Then the word sincerity. Sincerity. In Joshua 24.14, Serve him in sincerity. That's what God's in in truth. In First Thessalonians, First Corinthians five eight, uh, the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Second Corinthians one verse twelve, in sincerity and godly sincerity, godly sincerity, simplicity rather, and godly sincerity. Second Corinthians two verse seven, but as in sincerity of God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Pattern of good works, sincerity, loving the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, these things are Paul's last letter. Last letter, last chapter of his book here in Ephesians. And uh, he wants us to put on the whole armor of God to be able to stand firm, not drift, like the world is drifting. And other Christians, many Christians are drifting in their positions. But stand fast with this whole armor, seven different implements of that armor. And the Lord bless and use us for that purpose. Let's close in a word of prayer. We thank thee, Father, for Paul's, though he was in prison when he wrote this, I knew full well that thou art the God who has given us the implements, the armor of all these seven different things that we should put on if we're able to stand against the wiles of the devil, against the evil of our nation. Keep us strong for thee, help us to put on the implements, and guide us and direct us in all that we do and say. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. Amen. Let's take our hymnals again.